Um, this is the session on Israel, the global left, and global public opinion after 1967. Um, and we have three speakers. In the order in which they will speak, we have uh, Rick Nye to my right, who is managing director of Populous. Um, Professor Alan Johnson at the end, who is editor of Fathom and senior research fellow of BICOM. And uh, Dr. David Hirsch, who's a lecturer in sociology at Goldsmith College, uh, University of London. Rick. Thanks very much. Huge. Thanks, Dave. I've just been sort of asked to set the scene uh, briefly. I can't claim to be an expert on the global left. I have um, many sins that I'm responsible for, but that is not one of them. Um, wh what I can, though, hopefully do is provide a little bit of public opinion context to the, uh, the discussion that we're about to have. Um, every other year, uh, the program on international policy attitudes produces an international poll taken across 23 different countries where they ask whether um, people have a, those countries have a, a positive or a negative influence um, over the world around them. And just to put uh, in some kind of context, uh, the performance of Israel on the list. That is the bottom half uh, of the league table, and that is showing each survey going back to 2005. I think there's due to be a new survey coming out in the next couple of months. As you see, um, Israel's performance is, is relatively steady, um, though relatively poor and steady. It's on the sort of the international naughty step along with Pakistan, Iran, and North Korea. And I think What's interesting about that graph, apart from Israel's position on it, is what it takes to be in that company and also what it takes to shift people's ideas. You will see that Russia has come down over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, but you really have to um, invade Korea and your, uh, sorry, invade Crimea and your nearest neighbor in, in, order, in order to affect that change. You will see that um, during the Obama years, the United States managed to extricate itself from its sort of George W. Bush um, ghettoization. We will see uh, how well it does under President Trump. But the main point that I want to make here is, is that most people, most of the time, in most countries around the world, are not paying very much attention to the ins and outs of what is going on um, inside different countries or between different countries. And it takes something quite extraordinary, like nuclear testing, like uh, uh, a transformational African-American president to or invading a, a, a foreign country to move those sorts of figures. If you look then at um, the comparisons by country of people's attitudes towards Israel, you will see what I think you probably know already, that Europe is a far tougher audience for Israel than is North America and actually than is certain select countries uh, in Africa. So in the United States, 52% of people um, say that Israel is a mainly positive influence in the world. That compares with only 21% in France and below 20% in the UK and even lower in uh, Spain and Germany. And over time, uh, if you look at, if you like, Israel's strongest market, the United States, you will see that going back to the middle 1970s in the immediate aftermath of Camp David, Israel's performance over time has been relatively constant, but it's slightly improved. Um, the Palestinians' performance, who do you sympathize with more, this question is, has risen slightly. But with all of the intervening events and all the ups and downs, all the incursions, all the terrorist outrages, all the invasions, all of the withdrawals, um, it's a relatively stable over time picture. What it masks, certainly within the United States, however, is a growing division um, of opinion by party ID and by age. You will see there, whether you sympathize more with Israel by party, 75% almost of Republicans, three quarters of Republicans sympathize with Israel more than with the Palestinians dropping to only a third of Democrats. And then within that, if you probe further, you will see that within the Republican Party and within the Democrats, basically the further left you go, which I think won't be a surprise, um, the more sympathy there is for the, Israel for, for the Palestinians and the less sympathy 
who is for the Israelis. And indeed, the last time that Pew um, took this poll was the first time that they found um, a greater sympathy for the Palestinians than for the Israelis among people who identify themselves as liberal Democrats, actually with a small L or a large D. And I suspect that's also true of UK people with a large L and a large D. Um, when you look at the UK, we've been tracking um, people's warmth towards different countries and actors um, for the better part of a decade and a half. This is the consistent methodology we've used since April 2011, and you will see there that Israel and the Palestinians are running pretty level pegging at around 20% or just below in terms of the proportion of people who give them a warmth rating of between 6 and 10 on a 10-point scale. That also masks differences by age and by politics. You will find that people who... Um, were born before 1960, that sort of Cold War generation, tend to be more sympathetic towards Israel, whereas people who were born after 1980, millennials, tend to be less sympathetic towards Israel. And that is also related to party identification, where you will find conservative identifiers and UKIP identifiers being more sympathetic towards Israel than Liberal Democrat and Labour identifiers. So what's going on? Well, first of all, I think there are trends which are affecting people's attitude towards the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, which have actually very little to do with the substance of the conflict itself and the ins and outs um, as time goes on. The first is the decline, I think I would call it, of the appeal of progressive nationalism. Um, Nationalism is not popular on the left anymore. Patriotism is not really popular on the left anymore in Britain or anywhere else. It's seen as chauvinistic. Um, at best, it's outdated or outmoded. And at worst, it has very severe consequences. Um, national self-determination is less important to people on the left and less important to younger people than is self-actualization and global values. So you will find that um, when you look at whether people identify themselves as being global citizens or citizens of their country, um, particularly if you bear in mind Theresa May's speech um, at the Conservative Party conference where she said um, citizens of, of uh, everywhere are citizens of nowhere, um, these, this is the proportion of people who see themselves more as global citizens than citizens of their own country. What you find over time is clearly it's a function of economics. There's a severe hit after 2008 when people are forced to sort of reassess and hunker down. But over time, the proportion of people who see themselves as global citizens is on the increase, and that is being powered by younger people, not by older people changing their minds, as you might um, have understood from uh, the Brexit referendum over here. What that means in terms of, of framing the, the conflict is, as far as people are concerned, when they're paying attention, it's less about, I think, justice and equality, and it's more seen through the prism of group rights and, and power relationships. Um, you know, over the 50 years since the 1967 war, it's ceased to become a battle seen as being conducted between Israel and uh, neighbouring hostile Arab states and now it's a struggle between Israel on the one hand and the Palestinian people on the other. You know, Israel's gone from sort of plucky underdog to bullying top dog if you like and the asymmetric nature of the conflict has begun to filter through to even you know, public consciousness when they're not paying attention very much. Um, the other thing is I think suits that used to play quite strongly or were thought to play quite strongly like the fact that Israel is an ally of the West, is a functioning democracy, has freedom of the press, independent judiciary, a market economy, all of those good things um, are seen as less important by younger people than their treatment of minorities in general and Palestinians in particular. It's what you do with what you have, not what you have that looks like what other Western nations have. And I think it's also true that... Um, 
Israeli public opinion has become more right-wing over time, um, both through um, Russian immigration, but also through the impact of terrorism. You know, the country has begun consistently to return centre-right governments, and that's been noticed by the rest of the world. And it's quite difficult to say that ordinary Israelis are committed to peace when you're also saying that Israel is a democracy and Israel's democracy is producing governments which aren't, don't appear to be particularly interested in advancing um, a two-state solution or making concessions. So the result is that um, support for Israel has increasingly become, um, in our democracies, the preserve of older, more male, more conservative parts of uh, Western electorates and in the United States, uh, evangelical religious parts of um, the electorate. And what those people have in common, wherever they are, whether in Europe or the United States, is they tend to be resistant to group rights and multiculturalism. They're more attracted by patriotism and nationalism, um, and they're more robust about what it takes to combat terrorism, whatever the causes of terrorism. So they're both su tough in support of Israel, but also tough on the causes of Israel, as it were. They like, they like what Israel does, and it floats their boat. But at the same time, it also means that supporting Israel becomes less attractive for people who aren't older, more conservative, and more male. Um, and it impacts disproportionately on college-educated younger people, people on campus, and I guess the challenge for um, Israel advocates going forward is, is whether you can construct a contemporary narrative that's attractive to a millennial audience and doesn't just rely on some of the same things that um, we've always relied on when it's come to um, advocating for Israel among the older generation. And one, I'll leave you with this, which is also from Pew. This is the projection of um, the global population in terms of religion um, going forward. Um, over the next 40 or so, 35 to 40 years, um, the market share, if you like, for Islam is the only market share that's going to increase among global religion. Um, it will increase faster than the global population will increase, and by 2050, there will be more Muslims than Jews living in the United States and 10% of the European population will be Muslim. And they obviously are, tend to be younger. They are more sensitized to what's going on in the Middle East with, with their co-religionists. -religi and they present a challenge where, in a world where demography is often destiny, um, the need for a contemporary narrative is probably now more than ever. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks, first of all, to Rusi for being our partners. It's been a great experience, I think, and today has certainly succeeded beyond my hopes. Um, um, so that's fantastic. Um, and thank you for staying. It's been going since 9.15 now, so um, credit to you. My remarks will follow on, uh, hopefully, pretty directly from what Rick's had to say. I'm going to focus upon a relationship, that between Israel and what is called the global creative class. And a question, the degree to which that relationship is being shaped by the failure as yet to close what Ash Sussa has called the 67 file. So I've got three questions really. What is the global creative class and why does it matter? Is it becoming estranged from Israel and if so, why? And can Israel do anything about that? I'll be making two claims. First claim, today in our networked and media saturated global society and creative economy, if a country does become estranged from the global creative class, that's really a strategic dilemma for it. And secondly, that Israel is in difficulties with one of the two main parts of that class, not so much with the economy-focused creatives who feel as home in Tel Aviv as London or, or New York, 
but whom we might call, awful term apologies, the, the chattering classes, um, the politics, education, and culture focused creators. You know, if we want to be insulting, like Boris Johnson once talked of corduroy jacketed, snaggle toothed lefty academics. And so on. Um, okay, so first question w what is the global creative class? Why does it matter? First point it's a concept developed by the American economist and social scientist Richard Florida. Um, he developed it in the context of an evolution from an agrarian to an industrial to, from, let's say, the 1980s, a creative and global economy. The creative class is those people who are paid to use their capacity uh, to be creative, to create meaningful new forms. I'm, I'm aware I'm being abstract here. From new ideas to new inventions to new techniques to new ways of working to new ways of living. And to translate the flows of all those ideas and forms and techniques between one culture and another, one country and another. So they tend to be more mobile, they tend to be more cosmopolitan, and to an extent they tend to be post-national in their sensibilities, as we heard. They make up over 30% of highly developed economies, according to Florida. So we're talking about people in design, education, arts, music, entertainment, whose economic function is to create new ideas, new technologies, new creative content. They're the experts who assume responsibility for the creative rather than the mechanical aspects of their field, whether academia, higher management, media, liberal professions, and the rapidly growing high-tech and biotech industry. Second point, the creative class likes to cluster together and drive both the economics and the culture of modern societies. So arguably, far from being flat, as Thomas Friedman says, the world is actually pretty spiky. Economic activity tends to concentrate around those economic regions and particularly cities that can attract and hold creative people and projects, as Tel Aviv knows, but in a different way as the peripheral cities of Israel know in a different way. <laughs> Third point, the creative class helps to set the terms for the economic strength and the international standing of a country. Helps significantly. It's not the only factor, of course. In a globalized world, these flaws of economic and intellectual activity shape every nation state. So um, the facilitators of those flaws, the drivers and in innovators matter hugely. More, if we look at most attitudinal changes in Western societies over the last 40 years, the kind of things that we take for granted that maybe our, our even parents or grandparents thought were outlandish ideas, it's often mostly creative class minorities through the social movements they create and their use of soft power that reshape the common sense of society. Fourth point, Israeli commentator Carlos Stranger, all the way back in 2011, writing in Haaretz, um, said this, research by the foreign ministry has shown that the global creative class's attitudes are critical for Israel's standing in the world because it comprises most of the world's opinion leaders, serious international journalists, commentators, and filmmakers, most academics in the social sciences and humanities, and the majority of liberals in the free world, including the majority of liberal Jews. Mm -hmm. So that's who it is and why it matters. Question two, has it become estranged? Uh, I'll be a little bit more briefer here because I think Rick's given us a, a good introduction to that. It's important not to overstate things, I think. This is a, a BICOM poll showing favorability towards actors and warmth towards Israel and the Palestinians. So 19% say they're favorable, feel warmth towards Israel, say the word Israelis and it goes up with the Palestinian Authority, 11%, then it jumped to 20%. Perhaps during conflict times, but that was expressed in a different way in the Economist magazine, showing Israel at the, on the naughty step, as Rick put it. Um, so, one other cause for concern about these polls would be that the parties in which the soft creators. How many attitudes held only by liberal Democrats 20 or 30 years ago are common sense now? So one answer to the question is Israel becoming estranged from this class would be to say no and yes, depending upon which part of the class you're talking about. 
I would say, no, Israel's not estranged from the hard part, as I would put it, of the creative class, the techies. In the largest deal of its kind last week, Intel bought the Israeli driverless car tech company Mobileye for an eye-watering $15 billion. Israel's locked into the global circuits of hard economic, the hard economic part of the creative class without question, and that story is probably well known to you. Israel's startup nation, tech companies and global investors beating a path to Israel's door, finding their unique combinations of audacity, creativity, and drive everywhere they look, the highest density of startups in the world, a total of about 4,000 startups, actually one for every 2,000 Israelis, which is kind of spectacular as a statistic, uh, more NASDAQ exchange listings than all companies from the entire European continent, and so on. Israel's own creative class is growing rapidly, a cater of well-trained, highly experienced professionals, finance, marketing, technology, R&D, academic research, and they're in global demand, and the opportunities open to them are almost limitless. Maybe one million Israelis live and work abroad. So that network is global, and Israel's a genuine hub. But in answer to the question, has the global creative class become estranged from Israel, you might also have to say yes to a degree when we talk about those snaggletoothed lefties that Boris Johnson um, was critical of. And many in Israel have raised an alarm about that relationship. For example, Iran Etzion, who is a diplomat and strategist with more than 20 years' experience in senior government positions in Israel. Iran was deputy head of the National Security Council in the Prime Minister's office. He has warned that if Israel is perceived to be less liberal, more conservative, more religious, and generally less westernized than it was, if it is thought by the global creative class that a permanent gap has opened up between it and Israel with regard to shared values, with regard to the democratic Western beliefs, then the drift of opinion away from Israel will likely to quicken among those creatives and others. This is because it's simply no longer true if it ever was that, as David Ben-Gurion put it, what matters is what the Jews do, not what the Gentiles think. We just don't live in that world anymore if we ever did in a globalized, networked world. If a values gap opens up, it's a real problem for Israel. Values move the creative class. As a Tal Beg, a deputy legal advisor to the MFA said, when it comes to Israel and the tastemakers and the opinion formers, facts matter. But what's even more important is, as he put it, by what moral framework do I evaluate these facts? What frameworks are being made available by Israel? Secondly, the values of this class are often post-materialist. Individual improvement, tolerance, human rights, meritocracy, personal freedom, diversity, a live and let live ethos, citizen input into uh, government decisions, the ideal of a society based on humanism. And the values of this creative class are supposed to be for everyone. They're quite an arrogant bunch. <laughs> um, they tend to be universalists. They tend to think they're right. They don't tend to take an attitude of what's yours is yours, what's mine is mine. They tend to think everything is ours and let us tell you how it should be. They're quite cocky like that. The ability to project soft power is inseparable from the question of values and the question of the global creative class. Soft power was famously defined by Joseph Nye as the ability to get what you want through attraction. And he proposed that it arises from the attractiveness of a country's culture, political ideas, and policies. Um, in international politics, he said, the resources that produce soft power arise in large part from the values a country expresses in its culture, in the examples it sets by its internal practices and policies, and in the way it handles its relations with others. Seen as legitimate, soft power is enhanced. Conversely, Nye said, attraction can turn to repulsion if we act in an arrogant manner and destroy the real message of our deeper values. So the question to end on is, can Israel project soft power while the 67 file is in its current state? There's two views here. One would be to say, yes, it can, and closing the file seems to be the key to improving the relationship. Um, a Brookings survey in 2015 was analyzed by Ben Droyemini in writing in Ynet, and he warned, he said, look, American sympathy is towards Israel, not towards the greater land of Israel. He pointed out that the statistics are changing. 37% of Americans in November 2015 said they were in favor of imposing economic sanctions on Israel for ongoing constructions and settlements. A year later, he said that view is already shared by 47%. They're remarkable statistics. Writing with the regulation bill in mind, 
Yemeni was blunt. He said, quote, if the Israeli government insists on continuing its current policy, this trend will continue. There's a second view that says global opinion isn't really sensitive to Israeli policy and practice. Um, one sometimes hears the argument, it doesn't matter what Israel does, they, they all hate us. I think of this as the Millwall defense uh, after the English football team known for its fans chant, they all hate us and we don't care. <laughs> There's a more sophisticated version of the Millwall defense and it goes something like this. The global class is cosmopolitan, mobile, post-national, it will never get Israel. The lessons drawn from the Holocaust by the global creative class in Israel are diametrically opposed. One decided it meant nationalism was bad, the other that having a nation state with ramparts and an IDF atop those ramparts was essential. One wanted to throw off the nation state as a burden, the other yearned to acquire one as a refuge and redemption. However, the evidence as far as it exists, um, to me at least suggests that opinion is very sensitive to policy and practice. So when you test out certain messages with people, I'll give a couple of, of statistics. Um, when in the polling we did with populace in October 2016, you said to, we found that 56% of people were more sympathetic to Israel when they were told Israel has offered to give up large areas of its land in pursuit of peace. So there, I guess the question is the future to be the regulation bill on the one hand or a regional framework for mutual recognition, confidence building measures, separation and a two state solution on the other. We also found that in October 2016, 48% of people were more sympathetic to Israel when they were told Israel has freedom of worship for Jews and Christians and Muslims. So again, the questions posed is the future um, with the defense minister who recently said, I'm an Ode, had no place in Israel and those he represented should have the border drawn around them in some places to become part of another state, questioning their status and citizenship, or does it lie with President Rivlin's activism for a genuinely shared society and the transformation of budgeting allocation that happened recently to ensure a proportionality to all of Israel's communities. As, as Rick said, and I love the course, I wrote it down, it's what you do with what you have, seems to be very much the message. So um, in conclusion, just this thought, it seems to be connected. It seems to be that in the end, Israel's partial estrangement from this class and Israel's failure to close the 67 file are really quite intimately connected. And the idea of mutual recognition and separation, two states for two peoples, and I agree with Asha Sosa, it's the only show in town, remains um, the most likely answer to both because it satisfies the legitimate national aspirations of both people. And in our issue here, because it resonates with the values of both wings of the creative class which is not to say, of course, that making the impossible deal is easy. <laughs> um, for, as all of us in this room know, it's very, very far from that. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, now to finish David. And both our speakers so <coughs> far have finished within their 15 minutes. So Thanks, the Dave. challenge is on. <laughs> so. I've actually been really nervous all week about doing this talk, and I've been trying to work out why. <laughs> I shouldn't be really, because I've just written a book um, on all of this stuff, uh, on anti-Semitism and its relationship to hosti hostility to Israel, and it's all in my head, and it's all very clear, so why would I be nervous? And I think the reason I'm nervous just became clear to me. I haven't been here all day, I've been here half the day, and I haven't heard the word anti-Semitism. And there's a reason, I think, why I haven't heard the word anti-Semitism, is because it's just generally considered to be vulgar to raise the issue. It's, it's not cool, it's not sophisticated, it's not scholarly, it's thought to be a kind of action of Jewish self-interest, it's thought to be a dirty trick played by Zionists to raise and to discuss anti-Semitism specifically when it's in relation to hostility to Israel. So I think that's one of the reasons why I'm nervous. And discussion of anti of anti-Semitism is very often met not with consideration or interest, but with angry denial and counter accusation of bad faith. And you know, you guys, I'm near Downing Street. You guys are all in suits, and I'm trying to be sophisticated and professorial. And here's me being being the one who's raising the issue that even in a place like this, people won't raise. 
A few years ago, I heard a student union official at my college telling a cohort of our new students what the union does. In particular, he said it was running, running three political campaigns, one against increased tuition fees, another against fascism and racism, and the third against the occupation. Then he moved on to talk about student clubs and societies. Nobody asked which occupation. Even though at the time, British troops were still participating in the occupations in Iraq and in Afghanistan, he was referring, of course, to the occupation of West Bank. Everybody knew it. Perhaps he was also referring to the occupation of Gaza, which is widely understood within that milieu to still be occupied by Israel. Perhaps if he was a smart activist, he would have been content with the ambiguity of the term occupation, which can also be interpreted as Israeli presence in any part of what might be called Palestine. This ambiguity facilitates the maintenance of a political alliance between those who are for a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians, on the one hand, and those who define Israel and Zionism as an evil which needs to be destroyed on the other. But it is remarkable that for a student activist in London and for his audience, no explanation was required as to which occupation he was referring. Neither was it felt necessary to justify this campaign's place in the top three priorities of student activists in London. There's a tendency for the Israel-Palestine conflict to attain a place of great symbolic significance. In this way, the Palestinians come to symbolize victims everywhere, and then it follows that Israelis tend to become symbolic representatives of all oppressors everywhere. In this context, discussion about Israel and Palestine sometimes functions less as a way of understanding the small, intractable conflict on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean, and more as a symbolic narrative with global, universal importance. The conflict becomes an empty vessel into which we can pour our own concerns. British concern over colonial legacy, European concerns about Holocaust, American concerns about the frontier, Irish concerns about unionism and republicanism, South African concerns about apartheid. Israel-Palestine becomes the material, the kind of shared material with which we create our own social identities. Anti-Semitism is always, sorry, anti-Semitism always constructed the Jews as being the center of all that was wrong in the world. Contemporary left-wing culture has a tendency to put Israel back into the center, back into the position at the very fulcrum of all that is wrong with the world. This tendency is also, of course, highly disrespectful to the Palestinians. By constructing Palestinians as universally symbolic, their existence as actual human beings and actual groups and societies and a nation it goes largely unconsidered. Rather than human beings finding a multiplicity of ways to live and to struggle in difficult circumstances, the Palestinians find themselves portrayed as one single heroic victim of the ubiquitous Zionist evil. I don't wish to diminish the suffering of the Palestinians under occupation. That suffering is real and is ongoing. It consists in daily and petty humiliations which function as one part of the big and grave injustices which are done to the Palestinian people. I'm sure this has been discussed in this seminar today. Of course, there's also a context of the violence and the racism of the occupation is other um, human rights abuses that occur in the world and specifically in the Middle East. Yesterday was the anniversary of the uh, nerve gassing in Halabja. Um, we've seen in the last few years what has happened to other minorities in the Middle East who haven't had the ability to defend themselves, like, for example, the Yazidis. So on the one hand, we have the reality of the occupation, but on the other hand, thinking not in terms, and people were quite right in the last session, it was really actually refreshing to watch the last session because it was people who knew about the peace process, who knew about the occupation, who knew about the history of it and in detail discussing it. And that's actually rather rare because what we have much more often um, in public opinion, um, in the kind of broad global left, also on the right, also um, 
in Israeli public opinion and Jewish public opinion is much, much more kind of broad brush narrative. And the key thing that I would want to say as a sociologist about narrative is that narrative is a mechanism which binds human beings into social identities. It's a mechanism which binds together rational stories about who we are and where we come from with feelings. It's a mechanism which creates identities with which we can kill and die. So those big narratives are also very important, it seems to me. Um, many on the global left tend to think of Israel as being the party which makes peace impossible. It's the aggressor, it's the imperialist party, and it's the party which chooses conflict and it chooses war over peace. The concomitant of this, of course, is that if Israel chose, it could end the conflict. Now, I think it's quite important for a lot of the reasons that we've been talking about today to understand that this isn't true. But I think it's also something which is widely believed that if Israel chose, it could any day end the conflict. And it seems to me that that is an example of a kind of way of thinking about Israel as a specific, it, it's really a way of, de of, of, th of, of demonizing Israel in the sense that people are perfectly ready to believe, and it's one of their basic assumptions, that Israel chooses conflict. Israel chooses war. So it seems to me that that's quite important. Um, the left isn't completely ignorant of anti-Semitism, even in this context of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, where there is anti-Semitism, it tends to be thought of as the passionate cry of the oppressed. And people on the left are more and more educated to recognize opposition to anti-Semitism as a discourse of power which functions to consolidate the real evil, which is the imperialist and Zionist oppression of the Palestinians and Muslims. The global left is knowledgeable about the injustices of the occupation, but it tends to forget about the threat to Israelis. I mean, thinking about the aftermath of 67 in this kind of um, discussion, I'm thinking about many of the things which are left out of many mainstream radical narratives of what's going on. The things that are left out are the fact, for example, that, well, firstly, when anti-Semitism is thought of, it's thought of as a, an effect of the conflict. It's created by the conflict. It's an epiphenomenon. Very few people on the left are prepared to think seriously about whether or how anti-Semitism might be one of the causes of the conflict or whether cause and effect may <coughs> swirl together in a, some kind of a vicious circle. And thinking about the timeline, thinking about the beginning of the Arab boycott in 1945, just a very few months after the end of the Holocaust, thinking about Jeff Herf and Matthias Kunzel's work on the impact of anti-Semitism um, in the birth of Islamism and Arab nationalism and the connections between those political movements and Nazism, thinking about um, the fact that colonialism across the Middle East and colonial regimes were largely overthrown everywhere by what we might think of as ethnic nationalist movements, by nationalist movements which considered themselves to be Arab and define themselves as being Arab. So we very often get a narrative of Israel as being a kind of uniquely ethnic state. But of course, all across the Middle East, um, the anti-colonial nationalisms tended to define themselves in ethnic terms. And they tended to, apart from anything else, um, be extremely hostile to Jews. Jews were ethnically cleansed from the great cosmopolitan centers of the Middle East. These are things which are kind of left out of decent common sense thinking about the Israel-Palestine conflict. At the beginning, many on the left had thought of Israel as the state of the underdog, the life raft state for the undead, 
They had been attracted by things like the kibbutzim and the socialist rhetoric and liberalism. It was the Soviet Union which first developed the notion that Israel was an apartheid state and which pioneered the understanding of Israel as being a bastion of imperialism. This Soviet anti-Zionism stood specifically in a Soviet communist anti-Semitic tradition. And also thinking about 1967, the very first thing I think that happened after 1967 globally was the huge campaigns against people who were, who were designated as Zionist in places like East Germany and Poland. The Soviet satellite, where Jews were hunted down and purged from public life um, in the rhetoric of anti-Zionism and the rhetoric of opposing Israeli imperialism. And if you look at the years after 67, uh, five years after 67, we have 1972 and the Munich Olympics, which must have had a, a huge effect on Israeli public opinion, that the Israeli athletes were hunted down and tortured and murdered in this kind of global celebration of peace. The year after 72, there was another invasion by Israel's neighbors in 1973 with the Yom Kippur War. 1975, there was Zionism equals racism at the UN. 1976, there was uh, the hijack of the Air France plane and the rescue at Entebbe. So all of these things which are kind of left out and not considered really when people are thinking about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yet even then, of course, there was the peace process and the peace process was strong and as we know, in the end, apparently, for the moment, defeated. There are three points I want to finish with. Thinking about the way in which a kind of passionate, emotional hostility to Israel is a kind of norm on the British left and on the left more widely. One is the idea of mainstreaming. These Feelings and these narratives have been around on the left for a long time, in fact, much longer than the existence of the State of Israel, if one thinks about anti-Semitism on the left in general. But over the last very few years, we've seen a mainstreaming of these processes, of these ideas, specifically of a kind of anti-Zionist visceral hostility to Israel combined with a boycott politics. So we've seen such politics take the leadership of the National Union of Students when it used to be marginal in it. We've seen such politics take the leadership of the Labour Party when it used to be marginal within it. We've seen it, uh, we've seen Len McCluskey, the General Secretary of one of the biggest trade unions, um, arguing that claims about anti-Semitism are just ways of smearing the left. We've seen um, academics uh, embracing the idea of boycotting their is Israeli colleagues in a much more mainstream way. So the first problem is mainstreaming. The second is thinking about how hostility to Israel has become a marker of identity um, for people who consider themselves broadly to be in the community of the good. I can talk about more, that, more about that later, I think. And the third, which I think is really important, is that it's becoming more and more difficult to have a rational discussion about anti-Semitism, that anti-Semitism, as I said when I began, is considered vulgar, is considered suspect. Somebody who raises the issue of anti-Semitism is automatically considered much more suspect than a person who may have stumbled into anti-Semitic rhetoric. Anti-Semitism, we are teaching our youth is to be, re sorry, the, the talk about anti-Semitism is to be recognized as an indicator of Zionist bad faith. So denial and counter-accusation seems to me very important. And actually, denial and counter-accusation, rather than rational discussion and introspection, seems to me one of the ways in which anti-Semitism actually plays itself out, not in Israel and not actually even in relation to the Israeli-Palestine conflict, but in places like Britain and the United States. And not, although there is a process of mainstreaming, as we saw with the statistics, it's not entirely mainstream. It's still important within certain layers of, of, of our society. 
but within those layers of, of our society, it is important. And as, as Alan said, they're important. They're, impi they're opinion forming layers. They're the layers of teachers and journalists and the cool people and the good people. And we need to watch that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. We have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes for questions. Do you want to, should we take a round and then put them to the panel? This gentleman here first, please. Thanks so much. Um, Jordan Perry from the, uh, sorry, the research analyst uh, for Israeli Palestinian issues at the Foreign Office. Um, again, thank you for a very interesting round of speeches. I've just got two questions. I'll keep them very brief because then there's lots of other questions, I'm sure. Um, and it's actually addressed specifically to two of the speakers, so forgive me, um, but please do comment more broadly. Um, first of all, to, uh, uh, to Professor Johnson. Interesting, uh, the, this discussion of um, the global creative class and sort of to what extent uh, there is a kind of a engagement uh, or a kind of, uh, on, on, on or sort of an engagement on um, with Israel. Um, I'm just wondering whether there's, there's an assumption here that, that the global creative class, whilst it's a, a social categorization, whether it has the same value systems in and of itself, whether it approaches its dealings with Israel in a, in a uniform or with a uniform moral compass, or whether actually it's more a, a useful social categorization rather than a kind of, uh, um, I suppose, what uh, Germans might term Wirgefühl, you know, uh, this idea that we, we belong together as a, as, a, as a kind of uniform uh, or have a uniform moral compass. Um, my, my second question for uh, Dr. Hirsch. Very interesting, uh, you touched on, uh, I was very f fascinating, this idea of the capitalization of the O in occupation. And uh, you mentioned uh, there was a particular uh, talk where, uh, for a student union at your, um, at, your, at your college where there was reference to the occupation without any further explanation. And I'm, I'm genuinely curious in asking this question. I wonder whether uh, it's because of, is there something unique about the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories which, which causes it to be capitalized? I mean, one can point to perhaps the length or the fact that uh, you know, there was a transferal uh, some would argue against the Fourth Geneva Convention into the occupied territory on a on a scale that's that you know uh, which, which you can't compare to other to other um, areas of the world. So I'm just wondering whether there's something unique about the occupation that has, that has led to led to it being capitalised in that way. Thanks. This gentleman here. Thank you, Simon. Can I first of all add my voice to others? Uh, the Hockey Walk former diplomat say what an absolutely splendid series of, of uh, presentations we've had. I think Alan Johnson needn't have worried that we were being kept here. We could do with more. Anyway, um, you can't cover everything, even on a whole day like this. And one thing that's been left out, although we've had public opinion, of course, is sort mm. of external state intervention since 67, which brought 242, and therefore, in theory, brought a Security Council uh, supervision of the problem. Um, so it would be a discussion for a seminar. I think perhaps we, we know most of the answer. Why has the Security Council not implemented its own resolutions? Um, well, perhaps I'll leave it there. That one could go on, but I think that is a, a, a question omitted which would be worthy of debate, even if we think we know the answer. Okay. Should we take one more over here and then come back to the speakers? Thank you, uh, Mike Gapes, MP. Um, first of all, a little anecdote. Um, during the um, most recent conflict in Gaza, I received 2,300 emails from constituents about Gaza, and I had four about Ukraine. <laughs> and when I pointed out to one of my most um, critical and aggressive constituents that more people had died in Ukraine than had died in Gaza, I was accused of minimizing the deaths of Palestinians. Now, I, you know, I, I, this, this is very difficult because clearly there are, and there were, appalling things going on in Gaza, but there is a real selection that people have. But my question is, and it's probably, well, Rick might be able to answer it, but. Is there any analysis about how the impact of social media impacts on these issues? 
because clearly if you sign up to an organization, a pressure group, a campaign, and you agree to click a box, then as a result, members of parliament get hundreds or thousands of <coughs> almost identical uh, emails. Um, in the case of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, who are very well organized um, and run the BDS campaigns, uh, you get emails at one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, and they're in different batches and they're with diff from different people. They're all genuinely sent because these people have consented for the campaign to send. But you, you get over a period of two weeks a kind of constant mm. flow of emails from your constituents, most of whom are young, many of whom have signed up in college and university societies. Uh, but I, I just wonder, is there any analysis? Because, because it, this was also it's not necessarily reflecting the society as a whole, but actually organised active campaigning using social media. Great. Do you want to start with that and then we'll move along? Yeah. Um, I mean, we've done, we do a lot of work um, among young Muslims um, looking at where they get their news from and their opinions from and... A lot of it is from social media and mm. the sorts of routine conspiracy theories that they come up with as a sort of just off the cuff as a fact of life. I mean, the idea that kind of fake news was invented by Donald Trump is just not true. You know, whether it's um, ISIS is a creation of Mossad and the CIA, who was behind the 9 11 mm. bombings. So, it's not just the, the people who organize campaigns on the basis of what they say is going on. It's also stuff that isn't going on at all that thousands and thousands and thousands of young Muslims in this country believe just to be true because it's, it's, it's known, it's <coughs> well known, and they talk to one another and that's how it spreads. And the hostility that comes out of it, I think, is very, very dangerous in the long term. David? Um, yeah, I don't think you can explain the capitalization of the term the occupation um, in, a, in a purely rational way. Um, I don't think that the Israeli occupation of the West Bank is the greatest human rights abuse on the planet, nothing like. I don't think it's the, the longest or most enduring occupation. Some people want to make the argument in terms of that, that Israel violates its own um, aspirations. But, you know, on the other hand, North Korea defines itself as a socialist paradise on earth. I think any rational way of saying, well, this is the most important issue in the world for, for London students falls. So then we have to look at other explanations. Now, as I said, very importantly, the consequence of the capitalization of the occupation in that way is much easier to analyze than the cause, actually. The cause could be anti-Semitism, but I think that's much more, uh, much more complicated set of reasoning, but the effect is certainly to put the human rights abuses of Israel and Israelis center stage um, as being a, a, a signifier of identity for, you know, decent, good, young student activists in, in London. Um, so I think, you know, the cause is another question, but the, the, I mean, there are lots of causes. There's, you know, people are interested in Jews. There are, there's something about the Israel-Palestine conflict, given that people kind of think they understand it already, it's a way for us to talk, for, to discuss. It's kind of like the Greek myths, yeah? When Freud wanted to talk about Oedipus, he, he could talk about that legend that everybody with a proper education knew. So, um, so, you know, people don't know about Ukraine. I mean, I don't know how many people who were thinking about the Russian intervention in Ukraine even know that millions of Ukrainians were starved to death by Russians a few decades ago. How many people even know? And during, I think it's 2008, 2009, Karth led, is that correct? Um, at exactly the same moment, um, the Sri Lanka state was doing to the Tamils what the Israelis were accused of doing in Gaza. And nobody was really very interested. Alan. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the first question about the global creative class, is it fragmented and so on? It's I mean, I, I could be reasonably accused of what in social science they call lumping on, on a truly grand scale with the, the, the notion. So I, I'm, I was aware of that, just trying to get a certain discussion going. One of the interesting things about um, that cultural milieu or class is that it, it, it has no identity as a separate, partial, limited interest group. And you'd be kind of horrified to be told that it was such <laughs> a thing. Um, 
uh, it's very, it, it conceives of itself as people of moral good sense in that way. And there's a huge advantage with that, which is part of what we're living, we have been living through is the democratic revolutions of the 18th century simply rolling outwards in a beautiful way. I mean, you start off with liberty, egality, fraternity, and then you gradually take in progressively working class males, then you take in women, then you take in uh, black people, then you take in the LGBT community. Now we're starting to talk about trans community, and you try and sp extend that to notions, et cetera, et cetera. That's all absolutely uh, wonderful. I think Israel's issue is that even though you know, it, it can come top of the league in terms of uh, gay-friendly uh, Tel Aviv and so on and so forth, o other aspects of its existence which are rooted in its history and its, the conditions of its birth and the necessity of its survival in terms of those ramparts and the people having to be on them set it at odds with that, um, that universalism. So that, I think, is the, the issue, which is, I'm, I'm not saying any of this, it's easy to deal with, but I think that is issue, I Israel's issue in that way. Um, briefly on the Security Council um, question, um, I, see, I, I think in the long term, part of what happened to the Security Council is tied up with this story that I've just been telling about the rolling outwards of the democratic revolutions of the 18th century. And I think in time, um, even though there's a lot of patience with the genuine security needs of Israel, my own view is that that patience won't be extended to annexationism or, or a permanent um, occupation. And I think ultimately that, that opinion-forming, taste-forming class will have its day. Um, th I don't know how many people watch the Game of Thrones, but there's, this, there's a scene in the Game of Thrones where um, well, a, a kind of global creative class type figure, a counselor called Littlefinger, with some disdain says to the queen, um, knowledge is power. And the queen stops him and has her soldiers grab him by the neck and almost throttle him to death. And at the last minute, she decides, clicks her fingers and says, you, know, you don't have to kill him. And then she turns to the guy and says, power is power. Um, and I know that that's kind of the, the realest answer to what I've been saying. You know, it, it's all a bit fluffy, isn't mm. it, this stuff? And the reason I don't think it's true is another anecdote. The American neoconservative Norman Podoritz um, attended a meeting in New York, I think, quite ill-attended in the early 60s of um, left-wing people um, in maybe Greenwich Village. And the journalist who was there couldn't, couldn't even get the name right. He wanted to say they were Jacobins, the people in this small left-wing meeting. And, um, he called them jackal bins in, in the newspaper the next day in New York. And Podoris picked the story up because he said, the, the thing we don't understand is that those jackal bins were, were the taste makers of American society over the next 10 years. They, they revolutionized and transformed American culture in all sorts of ways. And um, you know, I think we do persistently underestimate um, the, the, the ability of the global creative class to simply keep going, form new organizations, new NGOs, new social movements, new media platforms, and keep going with this message and to influence. Last point about social media would be, um, in terms of what's interesting to look at mm -hmm. is, um, at Lancaster University, they have a group of people doing what's called corpus research, where they take in literally millions of emails and they have the technology to analyze them in terms of the messages and so on. And um, some people have been analyzing that with in terms of questions of Israel, anti-Semitism, and so on. You'll find it in the all-party parliamentary group research into anti-Semitism that appeared uh, recently. I, I, th I think one of the main things that's happening is it, people, of, generally speaking, of our age, we used to relate to journals and newspapers which had an identity, and we went to them, and we had some loyalty to them, and we got our cultural codes and political codes from them, whether it was The Guardian or New Left Review or The Telegraph, whatever it was. I suspect today, and I have grown up children, I've, I've watched them grow up and absorb media and newspapers and news and so on. Everything's just a screen now. You imagine one screen just going off into infinity. That, that's, that's, that's what they're absorbing, one screen after another screen. And each screen is <coughs> independent, I think. And um, that's a real problem for us because um, establishing screens with authority, with um, seriousness, that can really guide the dis debate in the, in the right way takes a lot, of, a lot of time and a lot of input and a lot of resource, and um, it, it's a really important thing to do because if we just leave the screens to the fake news people, we, we really will be in trouble. Thank you. Um, any more questions? I think there was one in the middle here. Yeah, I just wanted to ask this last speaker that you said that more males support um, Israel than, than women or females. So I just wondered why? I the kinds of people who support Israel are those who are more likely to 
buy what they have than what they do with what they have and those tend to be older tend to be more male and tend to be more conservative that the core sort of demographic that is driving support for israel in a lot of these western societies are people who haven't been touched or who have resisted alan's sort of inexorable triumph of the the good and the <laughs> cool and and yeah a lot of those people are either un, have, have not had the dubious benefit of a university education where mm. people refer to occupations with capital O's or they've or they've gotten on with their lives and not gone into the global creative class it's simply a tendency it's not a it's not a I'm not saying you can't be a female and support Israel I'm simply saying that the types of political movements that are most supportive of Israel tend to attract more men than women I uh, just want to once again say thank you for another excellent panel of speakers. Um, for those that don't know, Alexander Matthews from the FCA. Um, so Professor Alan Johnson talks of the group that he calls the creative class, which some way call the elites or the self-proclaimed elites. And they've taken a bit of a battering in recent years. Does that mean that there's now a unique opportunity for Israel to try and engage with the international community to get a, con uh, a conclusion to the c conflict? But also, that is there an imperative to use that opportunity based on the fact we've also seen what many in Israel probably see as quite concerning statistics about the global trend towards how people view Israel. And if Israel doesn't take this opportunity, will it find itself facing a more hostile international community with ho international governments having less mo ability to move in a way that could help Israel and also help end the conflict in a way that meets both sides' aspirations? I think um, we've rehearsed a lot of reasons to be, I think, sensibly skeptical to pessimistic about the, the chances for breakthroughs and, and so on in the process. I think, it, you know, underneath some of what we've been saying, we, we could register some, some reasons for, for optimism, I think, though. Um, one of them would certainly be Israel's <coughs> burgeoning relationships, as Asher was touching on, with several... Um, certainly pragmatic states in the region. Um, we teamed up with Chatham House um, last year to organize some, a track two event with a series of speakers from Israel and Palestine and so on. And um, there was no me by no means uniformity, but I think there was a, a sense there that this is a genuine opportunity. Um, I think you know, by having a new attitude towards the Arab Peace Initiative would s seem to me personally to be mm -hmm. the, the best way to do that. Um, but they were very hopeful of those, and these were people who had, you know, s seen and met with and toured around that region and, and talked about a new kind of uh, sense of the threats from Iran, the threats, threats from uh, Sunni jihadi groups and so on as well, forming new kinds of networks of interest that that could be, um, that could be looked at. Um, if you wanted to be optimistic about the Trump administration, <laughs> which um, isn't so easy, um, we had an interesting piece in Fathom by Claire Spencer, again of Chatham House, who said, you know, one thing is that he's not going by the rule book. He's not going by 20 years worth of peace processory. Um, and that might turn out to be um, something that creates new possibilities. Um, maybe we're seeing something of that in some of his statements um, today. That, that might be me being more pessimistic than I, uh, optimistic than I have the right rights to be. Just w one point I would make about Israel's um, position in relationship to what I called the rolling out of the democratic revolutions of the 18th century and so on. Um, for me, Israel is part of that. <laughs> the creation of a Jewish homeland after a millennia of persecution culminating in the Holocaust is absolutely part and parcel of the rolling out of the democratic revolutions. It's about the national self-determination of the people. And I think what Asher Susser said is absolutely right. The international community, I think, is on board with that. It's on board with that. It's on board with the UN resolution. It's on board with an Israel that coexists alongside what I think is the other homeland group of that, of that land. But it isn't on board with the dreams of, of Naftali Bennett. And m my sense is it never will be. So Israel has, has that choice to make. Sure. 
I think I want to say something um, about that too, about the um, the idea of the cosmopolitan elite in, in terms of what people are calling the new populism. Um, because it, I don't know about this, but it seems to me that there's one sense anyway in which what's been... Let me tell you, I, I've been studying anti-Semitism on the left for 10 or 15 years, for a long time, seems like a very long time. I was in the United States um, two weeks after the Trump election, and it was astonishing because there were all these very surprising things happening, and suddenly I noticed that some of them were really, really familiar. So when people were talking about, for example, Trump's final day campaign video, I don't know if people remember it, it was a beautiful example, a kind of ideal type of a conspiracy theory video. And it had specific Jews kind of pictured, people like George Soros and the rest of it, and um, it didn't mention Jews. So it was this kind of conspiracy theory video without Jews. And, you know, many, many American, Jewish Americans are saying, look at this, you know, look at this conspiracy theory, look at um, Trump's connections to the, to the far right and, uh, and the rest of it. And, and then the, the Jewish right is completely dismissive of it. And, and suddenly I was seeing things happening in that debate that I'd seen for years. So you had sort of well-known Jewish activists getting up and saying, as a Jew, I can tell you that Steve Bannon really likes Jews. So f first, kind of mobilizing their Jewish identity. Second, um, confusing the charge or the notion of political anti-Semitism with personal characteristics, yes? If he, does, if he goes to a bar mitzvah and behaves well, then he's not anti-Semitic. If he has political connections and shared narratives and the rest of it, then we can deal with that. Some of his best friends, you know, Trump and his daughter and uh, his son-in-law and the rest of it. And then the ver how very dare you? You know, the, the, Melanie Phillips was very clear about this the other day in Britain in her defense of Trump. How dare you accuse um, Donald Trump of being uh, concerned or, or implicated with anti-Semitism? There's not a shred of evidence. You're just doing it to smear. So all of these things that we've seen on the left for years mm. suddenly appearing on the right. An, an, uh, an anti-Semitism and a xenophobia and a racism which is kind of palpable and which is behind many things but which is denied and denied angrily and vociferously and defensively. Um, so there's lots and lots of... of um, to sum that up, really, I mean, I'm thinking that the, the sort of an, the, the anti-Zionist left and its growth isn't a sort of antidote to the new populisms, but it's actually part of it. It's one of them. It's, it's more linked to it than it is in opposition to it. Thank you. Um, we're pretty much out of time on this panel, so the last thing to do is to thank the speakers.